So um, before we get started, since we only have a few people here, let's talk about um, where everybody's at as far as Blazer goes. Do we have experience in the room or is everybody just kind of starting out at the beginning and, and what do we really want to touch on? You can consider me a newbie. Okay, that's you, George? Yep. How about yeah. you? Me too. I've, I've played around with Blazor server, done some little things, but nothing, nothing big or important. Okay. And I know Gavin and Red are both newbies as well. So that uh, helps me kind of tailor this a little bit. Phil told me that Nunug has talked about Blazor in the past and we were hoping that uh, we wouldn't have a bunch of newbies and experienced folks in the room at the same time. So all right, can you guys see my screen all right? Yep. Get this thing out of the way. Okay, so let's first talk just to kind of tee this up a little bit about current web development technologies. Um, Kevin, George, do you guys, are you developers or are you just kind of getting into the game a little bit? I teach software development for the Davis Technical College and we don't currently teach Blazor, so it's not something that I use much of. Okay, and what do you generally use? Do you do some web apps or? Yeah, um, we just use .NET um, ASP on one of our courses and then PHP on another one. Okay, cool. How about you, Kevin? Uh, yeah, I work for a company in Utah. That's, that's basically a Microsoft shop with C Sharp. <clears throat> okay, cool. SQL Server. So, so we know that uh, to make a successful web application, it generally involves a server piece and a client piece. And for the most part, that's going to be multiple languages, right? We're going to write our server piece in C Sharp or Java or sometimes Node. On the client side, we're going to use most likely a JavaScript framework like Angular and React or, or Vue. So to be a good web developer, uh, a full stack developer, you have to know multiple languages, right? So one of the end goals that Microsoft has in mind is that we take that out of the picture. We don't worry about multiple languages and um, everything becomes a full stack. So we're writing C sharp on the server side and the client side, which to me is wonderful. Um, I saw one quote from a company that started using Blazor to develop some of their internal web apps, and they said that it saved the company about half of the time and money that they were spending on, on web development before because everyone could do everything across the stack. So that was kind of their goal there. Um, so let's talk about what Blazor is. So Blazor, like Angular or React is a single page application development framework. Uh, so it's open source and built on open web standards. It's essentially what my, Microsoft wants us to know is just another part of the ASP.NET Core family, another tool in our, our tool belts. So to get started with Blazor, um, there's a lot of resources out there now. Microsoft is definitely not shy pushing resources out so developers can get familiar with things. Their main one is the .NET. Well, this one you go to blazor.net and it redirects you to this site here. So if we pull that up, then we've got a way to download all the tools we need and get started. Talks a little bit about how um, the code works. So in this case, we'll, we'll go over this in a second, but we've got our HTML and we've got our C Sharp right here in the same page and they run together. And the nice thing is that that C Sharp runs directly in the browser on the client side through WebAssembly. Um, let's see if there's anything else on here that so once we're ready to get started, you can click on that and there are multiple demos and resources that you can get used to to, to get yourself 
go in and get your feet wet with laser. Uh, another one that's kind of fun is um, it's called the blazer train. Does anybody know who uh, Carl Franklin is? He's one of the guys that did .NET Rocks, kind of a .NET talk show. Um, he's got just tons of resources out there. I'll show you that real quick. But his uh, presentations are more uh, advanced. You can start at the beginning as well, but you can also uh, basically see all the various topics. So synchronizing, routing, component lifecycle binding, it's very good information on Blazor and how it works. So if you need to have some more resources, that's a good place to go. A lot of what I'm talking to you about today is coming from Blazor University. It's also in the format of kind of a tutorial starting from the beginning and talking about each piece along the way. So if we look at the difference between, say, Blazor and Angular, here are some of the, the comparisons that we can make. They're both production ready. Now, Blazor, of course, is in its infancy still. But since the release of .NET, what is it, Phil, uh, 3.5 core, 3.0 core, it's been out there. But um, since .NET 5, which was released at the beginning of the year, it's uh, production ready. Uh, the biggest thing that we like about Blazor is, of course, it's an easy on-ramp for C-sharp developers. Uh, performance. Now, performance is one of those things where you need to talk about uh, what your choices are as far as a hosting model. There are multiples, of course. Um, Kevin talked a little bit about uh, Blazor Server. You can choose between Blazor Server or Blazor WebAssembly. Uh, Blazor Server, of course, runs on the server itself. So it doesn't take as long to start up because it doesn't have to download as many components. Uh, essentially what it does is you, uh, it's, it's very similar to ASP.NET, um, but it communicates real time back and forth between the server and the client via signal R, which is uh, a direct pipe between the server and the client. So it's quick, um, you can pre-compile it. The web assembly type, of course, downloads to the, the browser and runs directly in the client, but you have the full power of the .NET framework behind it. So it's very nice. Um, here's some of the pros and cons. I'm not gonna go through each of those, but those need to be considered before you do start your project. By the way, if there's any questions or you need to stop me for a minute, let me know. Uh, between Phil and I, hopefully we can answer the questions that you have. And we'll also show you a template that Mindfire has put together that we want to be able to share to kind of get you started with. Uh, and ours is a WebAssembly project. And uh, it's a great place to start to even start your uh, production projects. So. Okay, so to first create a page in Blazor, as we saw on the blazor.net page, we have a page derivative, which this is your routing as well. So when you go to a page, you're going to hit this page with forward slash counter. Um, if you put something in that's not defined out there on a page, it's going to come up and say, sorry, you can't find it. Um, you have HTML and you have a code block. This is very similar to Razor syntax. So you're defining here, in this case, a variable called counter, initializing it to 42. And then based on what you choose to do with that counter, um, we'll show you in a minute, you can increment or decrement that counter and display it right there on the page. Um, if you want multiple routes to be defined for the same page, you can put multiple page derivatives. So in this case, you would start with your root, um, root route 
shall I say, um, but you can put in another one so you can get to that same page in multiple ways. Okay, so for page interaction. Hey, Justin, does it matter the order of any of the code on that page? Um, so you mean as far as the, where you're... Right, where you're... Going? Exactly. You know, I can't imagine that it does matter, but I haven't tried it the other way. So that's something we can try in a minute and see if it still renders properly. We'll pull up a demo project here in a minute and we can try that if you'll remind me next time. Okay, so back to interaction. So here we're defining an HTML button and we're adding an at click. What that means is that click event is going to run a piece of code. And in this case, increment counter, which is in your C sharp code. So when it runs that, it's going to increment your variable and the counter is going to display right there on the page. Quick and easy. In fact, uh, let's go to a demo real quick. I've got one open that we can look at. Um, um, just for, out of curiosity, do we know where a Blazor app starts from? Of course, it's the index.html, right? So what you have in this startup, you have a div that has an app ID that will render the app app.razor inside that tag, which in this case is this. So and this will do your routing for you. And inside your main layout, this is kind of like the master pages of the old um, ASP.NET stuff. You've got an app body tag, which will render your, your different routes. Okay, so here we are with the counter, the code that we were just looking at. As you click, it's going to increment. Okay. Um, let's try out of curiosity. Um, a counter is right there. Nice thing about these as well, we can set a breakpoint in there. Now, uh, one thing though that you have to know is that it's a little finicky on breakpoints. In this case, it will hit it because it just turns solid red. So it looks like it doesn't matter. There's our breakpoint. Our counter is currently zero. And we'll go to one. Does it support hot reload? Yes, it does. Or um, hot changes? It does. Um, we can talk about that in just a minute, but out of the box, it's not really supported the same way that, say, Xamarin is, where you can just make a change and save it, um, unless you run the page in a certain way. So I've kind of documented that in our template. To start up, you would use .NET watch run, and you don't have to have the debug. But So if I were to come over to this and start up a terminal, or if we just want to use PowerShell, And the interesting thing is I watched a, a tutorial today from the program manager at Microsoft that helps put this stuff out there. And he was using Edge and he was able to get it to run and do a hot reload right out of the box. So I'm not sure if that's 
a later version. But so here, for example, we're on the, the main page. Um, we're going to add our counter component. So down here, it can see that it's it was built again and automatically refreshes. And now we have a counter on that main page. Does it support edit and continue? Yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> I'd be curious how they might achieve that, but I thought I'd, I thought I'd ask. Well, let's take a look, Phil. I mean, it's worth a try, right? So in this case, we're not debugging it. So let's kill that. And we're going to debug it this time. That would be a handy feature. Okay, so we're going to click here. And we're going to come over here and let's just try. That didn't seem to work there. That didn't work either. Well, I'm not surprised. Yeah. No so the, the interesting thing is, I found out as well, is you have to add your breakpoint before you start the code. Otherwise, it may not take effect. I do have a, a section we'll talk about debugging a little bit here later, because there are some things that you kind of have to keep in mind when you're debugging. OK, so let's talk layouts. Um, so a layout needs to inherit from layout component base. So our main layout inherits, this is like a using statement in a regular .NET page. Or a, sorry, not a using statement, a base class implementation. The inherit statement? Yeah. So it's going to automatically look for a layout component base page in the folder that you're running if you don't specify one. So you can have multiple page layouts and be able to have, for example, an admin layout or a, a logged in user layout or that type of thing. So, and you can nest them. So here's an example of one that if you specify an admin on a page that's further down in your folders, you can have it pick that one instead. All right. So um, as we saw a minute ago, it uses what's called components. So in this case, each Razor page is its own component. So here we're creating uh, a component called counter, and we can reuse that component on other pages like this. Uh, they have one already created with a survey prompt to give you an example. Um, we'll get into this parameter option here as well in a minute. Just out of uh, an FYI, it's already got CSS and Bootstrap built in. And it's, uh, let's open this one more time. It's already re reactive. So if we want to pretend like we're a phone, we can We already have that built into the framework right out of the box, which is very handy. OK, so let's talk about component lifecycle. As with any .NET um, class, 
there are there's an order to way, the way that it loads. Um, so you have to keep in mind what it's doing as it loads so that you know where to uh, instantiate your variables or load your data, that type of thing. So when it loads, you have the set parameters async that loads first. You have a on initialized and a on parameter set. So if, for example, let's look at the counter. If you define a variable in the wrong place, it's not going to last if you leave the page and come back. So and we'll show a little bit better example of that here in a minute. So binding, um, as with the counter, we saw how a variable in your C-sharp code is bound. Um, parameters is the other thing that I was showing you. Um, you can add a parameter so that it's uh, directly in your component. And then when you use the component, you can set that parameter through your um, HTML. So if I'm using, let's see, where did I have my counter here? So if I came over here and created, let's see. like that, then I could come over to my main page. And use it like that. So I can pass that that data into the component when I start it up. Okay. Um, so there are three types of and I'm not even sure what to call them, but literals, expressions, and directives. So essentially your at symbol where it's used. So in the case of a literal, you're not using an at symbol at all. In the case of a expression, the at symbol will be on the right. And on the case of a directive, your at symbol will be on the left. So essentially what that is, is this is bound to your C-sharp variable here. In this case, this is an attribute that's added because of your C-sharp code that you can use to bind your variable. Uh, so for example, there's some uh, expressions and here is a Let's see, those are expressions as well. Complex expressions you can add right in the code as well. You just have to put the these braces in. Uh, directives, on the other hand, we can so we can add a lot of different in, uh, directives to get the desired outcome that we want. So we've already seen the code, page, layout, inject attribute, we can use a ref, um, bind allows us to bind things two-way. So we've got an at bind. And as we bind, we also get an at bind event that is available. So if you were to type something in that's bound to a control, by default, it happens on change. So when you're done editing, right? If you wanted to change it so your at bind event happens as you type, you could change it to on input. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like that. Or your value. Okay. Anyway, so you have to have the value bound as well. Um, you can also use 
component events like an on mouse move and on click on key press all that's available to you as well okay um let's talk about events and to do that let's go to the template that mindfire has put together Nate has created uh, some NuGet packages that we've utilized here. Let's start with the dependency registration. So when the app starts, it of course has to register the resources it's going to use. So um, let's see, where's Nate's thing here? right here, register state manager services. So that way that we can both save uh, data to state, retrieve it, and throw an event when that changes. Another thing of note here, we've, we've got an API that we've set up with some models that we're sharing back and forth. So one thing that we're adding here is another JSON file. Now you have to remember here that you're running on the client side. So when the a normal app settings is used, it's not going to be readable from the client side. So Blazor provides with you or for you a builder.host environment based address. So what that is is an address of where you're running, where your server's at. So when you create, for example, an HTTP client so that you can get back to your server address, you would use that URL to talk to the server. So we're using that as kind of a springboard so that we can come back and grab this client settings JSON. And in the client settings JSON, we have an API URL so we can talk to our API once we figure it out where it's at. And I'll show you that a little bit more in a second. So as we load this page and let me start it up here and show you a little bit. I'm starting both the API with Swagger loaded in it so you can see what the API is and our template. So in this case, we've added an API get example where you can talk to your API and get data directly from a database. And another thing that uh, I'll point out here, we'll talk about in a sec, is also these components are uh, materialized design components called Mo uh, Mud Blazer. So we'll look at those also in a second. Okay, so back to events. So when I load that page, I have a user and that's part of my API models. So when the page loads, it's going to um, subscribe to a, a couple of different things. First, the state. So when the state commits that user, it's going to fire this event and this eventor both of these are part of, of Nate's package he created. It's going to subscribe to um, an event saying, if someone notifies me that that user has changed, I'll fire this event. And I've also added one for that user's address. Once you make changes to your state to get that to display correctly, you would call on parameter set async, which would refresh your page for you. 
So in this case, on parameter set is going to be your, your start. So each time the page loads, it's going to get the current user out of, the, out of state. So now to show you that, I'm going to stop to my page and start it back up. So although we uh, restarted the page, we still have, sorry, wrong one, we still have user data because it's been saved into your application state. So if we look at, I think it's session storage. There we are, local storage. So there's my user. There's my API settings, all stored in that state. Now, if I clear that state, I'm also firing an event to say that I cleared it. So it's going to commit. Okay, let's, we're going to create a new user. So we're essentially getting rid of all the information in it. We're going to commit that user to the current state. And we're going to publish an event saying that it's changed. And then snack bar, kind of like toast, is going to publish a, a message. So now let's come back over here and notice that that's cleared out. OK, so um, back to our other to our uh, event examples. So when I get a user, I've created a separate component for addresses. So here, as a parameter, I'm passing in a set of addresses. So as that user loads, if he has any addresses associated with him, I'm going to pass that in. And that takes place right Oh, so right here. So here's my component, and I'm binding my parameter to the current user dot addresses. So my current user, of course, is a just a standard model with a list of addresses in it. So since I have it bound here to my grid, then the minute that this user is uh, saved, it'll re retrieve that event back, um, set my current user to what I received, say that the state has changed, and return a completed task, which will automatically call uh, on parameter set async and refresh the page. This uh, grid that we're looking at is one from uh, the components that I was just telling you about, mudblazer.com. If you want some good looking components and components that are easy to use, this is a great place to start. So here's our grid examples. And you can click right out of of the grid here and have your code right there that you can just copy paste. But some of the, the power that you can see in this, for example, it's got search, it's got uh, options to turn off on and off hover over it. You can make it a dense grid or get an event when you have one selected. You can also make changes. Right to the data. So that's probably the best place to click. So pretty cool stuff. 
Okay, so back to uh, binding. Let's see if maybe we can just start here. Um, we've talked about parameters. We've talked about uh, how to bind. Okay, so as you go to a component as well, you can also pass data in as a parameter. So in this case, part of your route has data in it. Here a customer ID comes in and you can bind it to a parameter right here in your C-sharp code as well. Um, now, one of the interesting things it says for parameters is that their um, nullable parameters are not supported out of the box, but you can have two routes, one with a parameter and one without to get around that. So that to me, that says it's a supported. Okay, um, dependency injection. Um, let's talk a little bit about dependency injection. So to inject a dependency, you're using a derivative called inject. So that's just like standard um, dependency injection in a class when you're using the constructor, which means this has to be a known component and of course it has to be set up in your application startup. So in this case, we've got our dependency registration. We're registering those uh, components here in. So here's our MUD services startup and it's essentially this is a out of the box pre-built stuff. You've got this add MUD services, which is an extension method to register those. So what that will do then is make that snack bar, for example, inject it into the page automatically so you don't have to create it when you get in here. So then you can just use it automatically. Any questions on that? I know there's a lot of different ways to do dependency injection. Um, Microsoft, of course, is going to leverage their flavors. Okay, so let's talk about debugging. We had some questions there. Um, Microsoft, of course, has documented all of it. In order to debug properly, you have to be able to come into your app settings. Or wait a minute, let's see, it's not an app settings, it's lunch settings. And you add this inspect URI so that the framework behind it knows where you need to, de to debug. Without that, it's kind of hit and miss. But there are some other considerations. Um, for example, the startup classes or startup methods, for example, the uninitialized may or may not be hit because of how fast it starts up. Um, some workarounds that they've given is adding a sleep. Um, I saw another one where you would use, what was it, diagnostics.debug, something like that, to, to force the debugger. But trying to set a breakpoint, for example, in your, your app registration just plain doesn't work. So that's one drawback. Let's see this or this information I got from this Microsoft page. If you need that, uh, just holler and I can give it out to you. Uh, there's our question, Phil, about uh, hot reload. Okay, um, Blazor features you probably didn't know about. This is just something I found at the last minute. 
wanted to look at just to make sure that there's not anything we didn't really cover. Um, you can do anything HTML and CSS can do. Since you're running inside the client, you have full capability for HTML and CSS. Um, Blazor can do anything JavaScript can do. You can run a JavaScript interop. Let's see, I think I might have that in one of these pages. Maybe not. Anyway, so Blazor runs right out of the gate without any additional components in it. But of course, under the covers, it's using JavaScript. It, it downloads WebAssembly and it uses JavaScript to call it. It's also going to um, download the Blazor components with a JavaScript uh, file, a code that you have to include. Um, Blazor is also something you can add to any of your, your web apps, no matter what language it is. You just have, it'll run right there alongside of it without any problems. Um, you can run SignalR without JavaScript. Um, has anybody used SignalR before? It's a pretty powerful framework. I, we've used it for uh, communications with a mobile app, and it works pretty well. Uh, gRPC and PhotoBuff work. Uh, routing we talked about. You can create interfaces for your Razor class libraries. Supports lazy loading. Lazy loading JavaScript. Uses pre-existing .NET libraries. Okay, so that's just a little information. Um, so has anybody looked around to see what's all written out there in, in uh, Blazor? Here's a couple examples I found. Sorry. We looked a little while ago, um, probably a year ago, and what was what we found out there was all written in C and uh, or C++, and most of it was really cool stuff. They had a lot of emulators for uh, legacy machines or for uh, older OSs. Like, for example, you could find uh, Windows 95 running on it, I think. Something like that. Oh, cool. But uh, like I say, there weren't many, but we probably found them all, and they were all really cool. I imagine there are some more interesting ones around now. So here's some, a few of them that I found. Uh, Pac-Man, written in Blazor. Uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock. And that one showed in the, dot net, or in the Visual Studio magazine this last month. Uh, there's a chat application. That uses Mud Blazor as well, and that's, that's a pretty little app. Uh, blogging, Tetris, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Um, in fact, I had a page here that was in the wrong spot. Resources. This is one that uh, Microsoft suggests to go out and look at examples. This has a lot of Blazor resources that you can look at. Of course, you can see tutorials, books, videos, podcasts. Um, this lists a lot of those applications that are available out there for you to look at. Um, boilerplates, authentication, quiz manager, customer management systems, games, Flappy Bird. That's kind of a dumb one. I watched that one. Um, so hybrid um, is also pretty interesting. I don't know if anybody's heard of uh, Project Maui. Yeah, as soon as it comes out, we'd love to present it. Yeah, essentially, uh, Microsoft is already kind of working on that uh, 
or has part of it released in a project called um, Mobile Blazer Bindings. You heard of it called that, Phil? Haven't heard that, no. So this allows you to create apps that use um, Xamarin, for example, or use, let's see. So here's a Xamarin example with some .NET code in it. This also allows you to use a web view inside your application that runs your Blazor components, but then ties directly to um, your native resources. And that can get kind of complicated, of course, but essentially uh, the example that I saw was that you've got a web page running in a web view in a web app that you can click on to call a native resource like format your hard drive. And that was actually the example he used. And but only of once. Course, well, no, of course it popped up with a message that said, sorry, this is your system drive and you can't format it. Oh, too bad. But it was pretty cool. Um, if anybody's interested in watching some of the information on that, I've got a link I can send out as well. But uh, Maui, I believe, is just based on the Xamarin stuff, right, Phil? Or is that just or is it Windows apps as well. I, I wasn't able to determine that. I'm not sure. Oh, that, that brings up a great question. So if we go out and we create a new project, Blazor, of course, Okay, it looks like we have to use um, so it had some additional options that we could use. A progressive web app. Essentially what that is is it allows you to take the app that you build and download it as a standard web app. So it looks like a Windows application itself, but it's a web view running inside of it. Pretty interesting stuff there that they're dealing with. But that's all uh, currently available, so. All right, that's pretty much all I have. Anybody have any questions or examples we wanna try? So what do you think the current weakness of Blazor is at the moment that would prevent you from using any, using any new projects? The current weakness. That's a great question. Um, I don't know that there is a huge weakness that would prevent you from using it. Um, in fact, there's a lot of benefits. The only thing that's probably a drawback is that it's still pretty much in its infancy. infancy. Um, but at the same time, because it's a Microsoft and .NET framework component, there are already tons of resources out there for it. And of course, all free. And this is uh, open source. So you can go out and look at the code itself. You can uh, add to the repository, send in a, uh, sorry, send in the PR and and be able to contribute even. So I think Microsoft's going down the correct path with this, but the only drawback is your learning curve, I think. So what would be the, uh, is, is there really any motivation to be running Blazor server applications? I think it really depends on what your application is gonna do. One thing you have to keep in mind about running uh, C Sharp on the client is that it's just like JavaScript. It's, it's available for people to look at. And 
it's coming down, of course, as DLLs. But from what I understand, they are not ob obfuscated. People can decompile them and see your code. So if you're running them on the server, that's not going to happen. Um, the server is going to be a little less responsive because you're going back and forth between the server and the client, but it's going to start up faster and have, um, I don't know, it's just, let's look at these options real quick. You've got your full server-side capabilities, uh, the download size is smaller, and better tooling for debugging support. Okay, so maybe I, the natural next question is, is there a benefit to using Blazor Server instead of Blazor WebAssembly paired with .NET running microservices on the back end? That was a loaded question. <laughs> loaded or just too long? <laughs> Complicated. Well, so the way we do things now it might be we have Angular running on the client side with TypeScript. Right. And that seems mm -hmm. comparable to Blazor WebAssembly. Yes. But we pair those with microservices on the back end, which we would run in Java, C Sharp, or Node. We can still do that with Blazor WebAssembly. Yes. So I'm, I would compare that scenario with uh, Blazor Server. It seems to me like you have the best of both worlds in that scenario. And I'm having trouble seeing the benefit of Blazor Server when you have that available. I'm seeing kind of the same build. I, I have created several Blazor projects, and I always think, should I try Blazor Server in this one? And I always think, why would I? You know, as, as far as just a, a quick application coming out of the, the box, you can still hit your API. All your business logic is stored up on the server that way. You can share models back and forth between your set server and your client. And it's it's just quick and easy to build. So in my opinion, that's the the right way to go. I wonder if it it makes a nice migration path for backend to replace ASP.NET MVC apps or something like that. I think it does. And you know, in a lot of circumstances, you've got monolith applications out there, and you're looking for a path to upgrade them. This gives you a great way to take little pieces and to upgrade individual sections of your application without having to rewrite the whole thing. Cool. Here's uh, probably to answer your most your biggest question. Tooling and debugging are subpar. And really, that's not for long. .NET 6 is going to solve a lot of this, and they're going to have uh, more of the, the .NET MAUI stuff and the, all the additional uh, support for it that we need. And each day that Microsoft works on this, there's more resources available. And of course, each update with Visual Studio, you get additional changes that support this faster. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's just a win-win, I think. Cool. Um, I just popped open the chat and I see that Alma points out Maui is basically based on Xamarin Forms. And I now that he says that, I'm pretty sure I knew that. That's true. So he says it's yes, basically that, that Xamarin Forms sense. 6. Xamarin Forms 5, I think, just came out, and we wanted to do that next month if we can get someone to commit to it. And I think we do. So 6 is going to be the one after that, hopefully. And I think they said that they're point, they were pointing toward the end of this year, and I think it's been put off again since then. Could be wrong about that. Somebody should Google it. Okay, any other questions or uh, comments? Well, that means you've done a good job. Yeah. Or they didn't understand it. That's always a possibility. That's a possibility. Too. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I want to thank everybody for coming. Encourage them to come again. Tell your friends. Sign up. Uh, follow us on all the social media we're on. Find those on the About page at newnug.org. And see you next month. <laughs>